realize the background. No pun intended. No, 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 no pun intended. You, you, you did the remarks to her, Frank. Okay. No. Uh, as you know, over the last year or so, we have had, we've had had a very good safety record, and we won a number of prizes for it. But there's one part of the safety record that did stand out, and that was along the lines of sprains and sprains, back injuries, sprains and sprains, arms and muscles. And uh, we knew we needed some help on this because we don't have officials in that point that can address that type of injuries. So what we did is we went on the outside and we listened to a lot of presentations, and uh, one was from Human Tech, and we've had them in a number of times. In fact, we've had them in for two or three day sessions. And what we decided to do was to give awareness sessions to all of the people in the plant. That's Beth Ward, Syntec, the Coke Works, and what's left is structural. So we've been going around and giving these classes to all of the people <coughs> so they know what to look for in the field of ergonomics. And with us today from Human Tech is Sharon Abel. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay, Frank. Thanks. Um, I'm an engineer for Human Tech, which means I, it's my job to not only go out and train and do stuff like this, but to look at people's jobs. Uh, we do a lot of industrial work, but we also do some office work. This presentation is more geared towards the industrial side, but I'll try to throw in some office stuff for you guys. Uh, the slides will all be in industrial, but I think you'll understand. We're going to do three things today. First thing is, is we're going to find what the word ergonomics means. You're going to hear me use the word ergo, short for ergonomics. Doing this training all day, ergonomics gets to be a mouthful for me. Second thing is we're going to relate this to you. Why is this important to you? Why should you be doing ergonomics? Third thing we're going to do is I'm going to pass out this plastic hitless card over here. This serves as a communication tool. And we're going to go through what everything on here means by the end you'll understand exactly uh, what all the phrases on here mean. Okay, let's start with a definition of ergonomics. Okay, ergonomics is the study of work, very basically. Okay. It's a Greek word. Ergo means work, nomics means the study of. Study of work. Very basic definition, gets the job done. I kind of need something a little more meaty. Let's turn to the dictionary. The dictionary says it's the art and science of reducing physical, psychological problems that might arise in the interaction with people, the equipment, and the environment. Okay, I have a hard time memorizing that one. We do this all day, still have it come down. Very hard to memorize, very wordy. Right? It's true, though, exactly what ergonomics is it doesn't give me a good feel for it, though. There's one more thing about ergonomics. This. It's the fact that ergonomics is a process, not a program. There's a difference between those two words, process and program. A program has a beginning and it has an end. A good one uh, for me, an example of a program, is an exercise program. We're all familiar with this one, right? January 1st, New Year's resolution. They tell me I need uh, three days a week. Good exercise, running, jogging, something. Okay, so pretty gung-ho that first month doing it three days a week, and then I'm lazy, tired, bored, I have a whole list of excuses. I'm traveling too much, just don't feel like doing it. By May, dead. It's over, right? So how about how long most of this last? A couple months. Beginning, end. That's a program. This is a process. It has a beginning, and then it gets into this cycle. It's never ending. It starts with awareness training. That's what we're in right now. Then it gets into identifying a problem job. Finding the, the jobs or having the ergonomic problems out there. Once you find the jobs, you can identify the tasks, parts of the job that are causing the problem. Is it the bending, the twisting? What part of the job is it? Once you found the part of the job, you need to compare those risk factors to guidelines. People like OSHA help us set some of these guidelines. Checking for success is the last one I haven't mentioned yet. Well, implementing solutions pretty obvious. Once you found the problem, you need to fix it. Implementing solutions. Checking for success is often the one that's overlooked. Have you ever had something in your job changed? Um, somebody used your computer, didn't put it back the way it was, and somebody used one of your tools, 
and put it back. They didn't check for success. Okay? They changed part of your job and expected you to keep it like that. They need to ask you if you liked it. And that's not checking for success. And then we start right back up at the top, finding the next problem job. Identifying the next task service factors. Guess in this, it never ends. Okay? It seems like our work's never done, and that's true. So we have the fact that ergonomics is process, not a program. We have a big, long dictionary definition. It's hard to remember. And we have the fact that ergonomics is a study of work. Still need something more practical. Something that when you go home today, back to work, somebody asks you what you learned, you can tell them this is what ergonomics is. Okay? Blinding flash of common sense, not rocket science. It's not very hard to learn. This is something that's very intuitive. You'll, you'll get to see this as we go through uh, the rest of the hour today. It's common sense. Now here's an interesting slide. It's the word cuz. Cuz stands for because. There's a big red line through it. That means we don't want it. Because is an answer to a question that I ask all the time. This guy is a computer manufacturing operator. He leaves down to the ground every couple minutes, pick, picks up a piece of stock, and puts it on that cart behind him. Okay. And I ask the question, why is the stock on the ground? What's the answer? Cuz. Cuz. you paying attention. That's what cuz is. Usually follows a couple words after that. Um, cuz, it was like that when I got here this morning. When they built the plant, that's how they did it then. That's why I did it. Cuz, I never really thought about it. And cuz is kind of a different form of, I don't know, never really thought about it. Cuz is our enemy. It's not something I want to hear. Okay, here's another one. It's a tray of tools that are on the ground, and the operator has to use these tools every couple minutes. Why are the tools on the ground? Because a good one for the office, I don't have a slide of this, is the operator that's on um, keyboards right here, monitors over there. Okay, that's a cuz. Why is the monitor over there? Because there's not enough room on the desk. They have to arrange it so the monitor is right in front of the keyboard. That's a good cuz. talk about sports for a minute. Just drop ergonomics and talk about sports. This is on everybody's mind. Okay. You need four things to become a world-class athlete. Somebody's really good at what they do. First one of these is skill. They have skill. You have to be able to throw that ball farther. You have to be able to run faster. You have to be able to jump higher than anybody else in your group. You have to have skill. Two, is will. You have to have that urge and that desire to win. You have to wake up every morning and say, I want this. I want my team to win. I want to be the best. Teams might be equal in skill, but if one team wants it more, they're going to win, aren't they? Your sportscasters say that all the time. Pretty equally matched team, but that team wanted it more. Okay, so they're going to win. Third is this. Good coaching. Coaches steer you away from your weaknesses and towards your strengths. They offer a little bit more objective point of view of your performance. You take that guy who's running the hurdles, he's jumping hurdles. The last 10 seconds or so, he consistently loses. He's clear in the hurdles, he's not falling. He can't figure out what he's doing wrong. And the coach notices, hey, you're dipping your shoulder right as you go over that last hurdle, and that's adding time. And the athlete really gets seen this. Never notice that. But the coach does. That's why we need coaches. Good coaches. Okay, four. This is the most important one. Great. Not good equipment. Great equipment. Great equipment. Let's take a look at a piece of good equipment. The New Balance tennis shoe. Okay. That's a piece of great sports equipment. A lot of time and energy and effort money went into building this shoe. They didn't just throw it together. It took years. Okay, they looked at the heel strike pattern. They looked at the toe reinforcement. They looked at the lacing structure. They looked at the Achilles tendon padding. A lot of effort went into this. Possibly why they cost what they do. Why is that? Because lack of this great equipment will hinder a world-class athlete. Can anybody think of a sport out there that doesn't involve water doesn't have a shoe specifically designed for it. There's some out there. 
sumo wrestling, any martial arts. Okay, but my point is almost every sport out there has a shoe designed specifically for it. And that's because of that lack of great equipment. It really caused a problem for a good athlete. So let's take a look at this. That's Carl Lewis. He's an Olympic gold medal runner in a pair of high heels. Okay, what's wrong with that picture, right? Let's take Carl through our four opponents of a great athlete. Does he have skill? I bet Carl Lewis has skill. He's got a closet full of medals. Most of them are gold. What about Will? Does Carl Lewis have the will to win? Yeah, he does. This guy's training regimen is out of this world. Not only does he train physically, he trains psychologically as well. He wants to win. Good coaches. And Carl Lewis has good coaches. He's got enough money to buy any coach he wants. He's got really good coaches. In this slide, does Carl Lewis have the best equipment for running a race? This just sincerely drives home my point about great equipment. He might have skill, he might have will. I wonder about the good coaches who are running these shoes. <laughs> but in this slide, he has terrible equipment for running a race. Okay? Say they're real strong high heels, they're still, still reinforced. Right? What's going to happen when Carl Lewis starts running this race? It's going to be a hassle. I've tried this before. I think oh, every woman in here has had to run in high heels before. It's not a pretty sight. It's a real hassle to have to do this. You can't get very far. And after a while, it really starts to hurt. You're in pain. Carlos keeps going around the track like this because he's got skill and he's got the will. He's going to run in these shoes. Not only is he in pain, he's pretty much ruined his feet. And after days of this, bones are going to start to shift. He's never going to run true again. That's what we call a CTD. It stands for Cumulative Trauma Disorder. It started off as a hassle for him, then became painful, then we've moved into this disorder stage. Okay, hassle and CTD. Let's see this again. So we have a button of steel employee. This could be any one of you. This, however, is an industrial athlete. This guy lifts Lowers, pushes, pulls, walks, and runs. Industrial athlete. How many days of work do you think this guy has per week? They work five days a week, you guys do. Okay. They work eight hours a day. How long do they last in this industry? 30 years is the average. Okay. Had people come up and I've been here 50 years. Okay. They work very hard for a very long period. Of course, they're not quite paid as the world class athlete is. They're doing the same things. They're industrial athletes versus a world class athlete. Do your people have skill? Do you guys have skill in your jobs? You better believe you do. I can't do your job. You have to be trained to do your job. What about Will? Do you have Will? Come to work every day. Actually, this is one of the most willful groups of people. I've been here all week. Everybody has showed up when they on time when they were supposed to. And I know the circumstances here are not that great. Very willful. Good coaches. You guys have some of the best coaches I've seen. Good, great equipment. Not good equipment. You need great equipment. Do you have the best equipment money can buy? Do you guys have the best equipment money can buy? <clears throat> eh, it's, it's this. It's average. The rest of the world has average equipment too. In the office, do you have the best computers, the best keyboards, the best wrist rests, money to buy, the best chairs, the best desks? Okay, there's certain things out there that you need in order to perform well. So that's an industrial athlete. Here's that hassle pain CTD again. Remember the computer operator in the uh, manufacturing facility had to lean down to the ground to pick up what he was getting, twist and put it behind him? That started off as a hassle. Yeah, it's not so bad doing that, bending down. It takes a little longer, but it's a hassle. A couple weeks into the job, he goes home at night. Ugh, back hurts. Back hurts, I'm going to take some Advil, put some heat on ice, going to bed early, waking up pain. He's in pain now. One day, he's leaning over, oof, out goes his back, throws his back out. That didn't just happen. 
that happened over weeks, months, years, bending over like that. Okay? That's a cumulative trauma disorder. Hassle, pain, CTD is an injury that builds up over time. Here's a common sense statement. This is something we all agree to be true, right? We're supposed to be designing for what people are good at, designing against what they're not good at. But we don't always do this. Okay? There's some things out there that people are okay at, but machines are a lot better at. There's other things machines are okay at, but humans can do a lot better. Okay, so let's make a list here. We have people and machines. Anybody name something that a machine is better at? Lifting. Lifting. Good. There's a lot of frames of hoister on this place. Your, your products are really heavy, five tons. Okay. All of us in this room together do not lift five tons. You need that machine. What about humans? What can we do much better? Thinking. Thinking. Okay, we are much better thinkers than computers. My computer can think, right? It can make small decisions. Your computer can think yes, no, greater than, less than. But it took a human to program it, first of all. And they're not that good at it. They can't reason. They can't make big decisions. But what's something else for the machine side? Not doing something over and over and over again. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Okay, that's called repetition. How about one more for the people side? Anything? We have to be better at just thinking. Inspection. Inspection. That's a good one. Picking something up and knowing if it feels right, if it looks right. Okay, we can program a machine to do that. People are better. Inspection is kind of a funny one, though, because a machine is better at judging some things within tolerance, a micron, something very small. Okay? So each situation is different. The whole point of this exercise is to show you that people have the things they're good at, machines have the things they're good at. You need to design with that in mind. Okay? When we design with that in mind, when we have people doing thinking and inspecting, we have machines doing lifting and repetition, we got what we call design support. Okay? That's worker health and safety, quality productivity, things that make us money, things that keep us well, good things. Do the opposite. People have doing the lifting, the repetition, getting into design mismatch, hassle, discomfort, pain, injury, disability, things that make us sick, things that cost everybody money. Good ergonomics is on the design support side, and that's why we're here. Okay, I'm going to pass out this hit list card. This is um, Years to keep. You guys all have one? Oh, yeah. You guys want to suck? Okay. Everybody has one. It's plastic. It is portable, small. Put it in your pocket. Um, for now, keep it out, though. Keep it at your computer. It serves as a communication tool because everybody in the plant will have gone through this training by tomorrow afternoon. Okay. And everybody knows what all these things are by the time I'm done. And you're all going to be speaking the same language. Let's start at the top of work doesn't need to be a pain. Another common sense statement, right? Not something we always listen to, though. It might be expected that our wrists hurt after a day of typing. Okay, that shouldn't be the rule, though. That shouldn't always be happening. Work doesn't have to be painful. Would you do it this way? It's a very powerful question, especially for someone like me who goes out to different companies and watches other people do their job to keep it fix it, what's wrong with the job? So I want you to ask yourself that question right now. Would you do it that way? Would you? No. Oh, not. Nice. Okay, I wouldn't do that job. He's not in that position once or twice a day either. He's in there seven hours of the eight-hour shift. Not only is this a worker health and safety problem now, because it was back and neck, it also becomes a quality issue. That guy is doing is putting the rear support brackets on the bottom shelf of that bookshelf. What do you think is always wrong with the bookshelf by the time it comes off the line? Think that bottom shelf's in right? 
like, nope, it's never in right. Can you blame the guy? No. Okay. I wouldn't do it this way. They did not use common sense. What can we do to help them? Think of anything that could possibly help. Raise it. Raise it, raise it up. Okay, this is, uh, you can tell by looking at this, this is a recipe for disaster, isn't it? This guy is in charge of getting a chemical out of this box up here. And the chemical, if he gets it out of skin, will burn him. Okay, it's caustic. And those, that chemical he's reaching for is in a little glass jar. And he's on stilts when he's up there. Stilts. Would you do it this way? I wouldn't be on stilts for any reason, much less dealing with a chemical that could burn me in a glass bottle. So what happens? What do you think is going to happen someday? He falls off the stilts one day, okay? And glass bottle breaks, the chemical spills on him, it's burnt. Everybody is very upset. It's a big accident, this chemical plant. Okay, so committees are formed. People are really starting to think now about this. What could they do? They're thinking, what can we do to make this job safe? This never happens again. And they think, they think, a couple months later, they come back with their answer. What their answer was? To make that bottle unbreakable. <laughs> is that the answer we were looking for? No. Okay, what do you do here? It's the obvious solution. Yeah, bring the whole thing down. Have the guy stand on the floor like the rest of us. But maybe that's not feasible. Maybe there's piping going in on there. I don't know what's behind these walls. It's not possible. What else could you do? Flat floor. Okay. They're pretty cheap. Cheaper than a worker's cop plane. Cheaper than hospital bills. Okay. I wouldn't do it that way either. Okay, we talked about these already, these CTDs. Has anybody ever heard of the uh, fire triangle? Three things you have to have in order to start a fire. Can you help me out here? Oxygen, heat, and fuel. Right. Three things. What do you do to get rid of a fire? Take any one of them away. You really want to make sure you don't have the fire to take two or even three away. One of them will do, though. In ergonomics, we have what we call the ergo fire triangle. Okay, the big bad boys are force, frequency, and posture. The hit list card, this gray box on here, says force, frequency, and posture. Okay, get rid of an ergonomics problem, all you have to do is take one of them away. Okay, force, what do I mean by force? Stuff like lifting, that's a force on your back. Pounding something into place. Using a hammer, that's all force. Frequency is repetition. Doing something over and over and over again. All throughout your shift. Posture doesn't just mean slouching. It means bending, twisting, putting your neck backwards, sideways, putting your wrists in weird positions. Okay, and most of the hit list, this big list down here, most of them have to do with postures. And there's a reason for that. I think two of them on there are not postures. So we have our triangle. Force, frequency, and posture. Let's say you have a job and the only problem with your job is force. You're pounding something into place. But you're not doing it very frequently. When you do it, you're in pretty good postures. Okay, you're four times more likely to develop that CTD, that cumulative trauma disorder. You're four. Say you have a problem with frequency. You're doing something over and over and over again. But you're doing it in perfect postures. You're not exerting any force when you're doing it. Four times again. More likely. Let's look at posture. Say you have a job with your wrist bent all day, typing, say. Okay? But you only type maybe an hour out of the day. You don't have a frequency problem. You don't have a force problem. You're just in this really bad posture for an hour. You're not four times, you're ten times more likely to develop that cumulative trauma disorder. And that's why we focus on it so heavily on the headless card. You get your bigger bang for your buck, so to speak, when you go after posture. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with the hands and the wrist. We're going to go to the elbow, shoulder, neck, and back. Okay, this is an uh, inside view of your hand, wrist, and forearm. You don't have a lot of muscles in your hands, which is uh, not what you think. 
the only things the muscles in your hand do are this. Open and close your fingers side to side. To open and close your hand takes these muscles down here, your forearm. Everybody grab your forearm like this. Open and close your hand. You feel all the muscles in down there, don't you? They're down here. Your muscles act as pullers. When they contract, when they shorten, they're connected to these cables, which are your tendons. They're connected to your levers, which are your bones. So when my muscle shortens, pulling on these, hand closes. Same thing when I open it. These muscles shorten, pull on these tendons, open my hand. Very simple system, works pretty good. Okay, but there's a design flaw in the wrist. This is a cutaway view of your wrist. There's a lot going on down there. Okay, you have some bones down here, you can feel them. You have this tough leathery ligament holds everything together. You've got those tendons running through there. If I were to give you a piece of rope and I told you to break it, would you be more likely to break it by pulling out real hard like this or by doing this? Running it over a tabletop, fraying it, pulling it. Tabletop's a good bet. Much better than standing there pulling it. This is where it's the strongest. That's what you're doing when you're working in postures like these. Okay, these are your tendons which are like ropes, cables. You're wearing them over this edge, this tabletop. You work like this, okay? But the body's number one response to that wear and tear is for those tendons to swell. And that's the problem. No room in here to swell. Think those bones are gonna move out of the way? No. Think that tough leathery ligament's gonna give away? No. One thing I haven't mentioned is that median nerve, that red median nerve. And that's what takes the punishment. The swelling tendons are now pinching on that nerve. Pinch nerves hurt. Okay, does anybody know what this whole thing's called? No? It's carpal tunnel. That's exactly what carpal tunnel syndrome is. Okay, so it starts off with swelling of the tendons, which is tendonitis. Keep doing it. Keep working like that. You're going to get carpal tunnel. People, office people get this, tend to get this more so than anybody. You're typing. Typing away, everything feels fine. It doesn't hurt to do this at all. You like that all the time, though. Look at these tendons. It's so over the tabletop, right? That's why people that type get carpal tunnel. One of the ways to, to fix this is something so easy, so cheap, for those wrist rests. They're about that thick. All they do is this. They bring up my arm just a little bit, straighten out my wrist. So that's why people use wrist rest. That and they're more comfortable than sitting just on the flat desk. Okay, so that's part of tunnel syndrome. What this boils down to, with all those postures, is what we call wash rag. It's any posture in your wrist used when you wring out a wash rag. Okay, there's names for this. It's extension, inflection, and radial ulnar deviation. Okay, but wash rag is something we can all identify with, something we can always remember. There's a good way to tell if you've got wash rag in your job. If you take a point on this person's elbow and you draw a straight line, if it comes out their wrist, they have wash rag. If it comes out their middle finger, they're fine. They don't have it. Okay, so does this person have wash rag? Yeah. How yeah. about this person? This isn't quite as obvious. Draw the line. This one's coming out her knuckle. Okay, it's not going through her middle finger. That's wash rag. How about her? Goodness. Is that, yep, that's wash rag too. Good. Okay, this is the bottom line. Try to keep your wrist straight. This is not to say you can never bend your wrist throughout the day. Okay, you can. Your wrists are meant to bend. You're supposed to bend. Okay, but don't sit like this all day. Don't type like this all day. Don't use your mouse like that all day. Okay? If you have to have it, don't do it with force, and don't do it very frequently. You're still going to have a problem working like this. It won't be nearly as bad if you have, don't have those two. Okay, tool target and wash rag kind of go hand in hand. And this is where we're going to get a little more industrial. Does this person have wash rag? Yep. Yeah, just a nice curved line there. Okay? The tool target, you can either change the tool or you can change the target. So let's go ahead and change the tool to an inline tool. That other type of tool is a pistol grip tool. This one's inline. Can we get rid of the problem? Nice straight line. A nice straight wrist. Okay, the other thing you can do is change the target. So let's rotate that engine up 90 degrees. 
the original tool. Fix the problem, didn't we? Okay. Here's a real life example of an inline tool. Not only that, it's, it's hanging, so it doesn't have to support the weight of it. Okay, now think real hard before I answer this. Uh, this person's pressing palm buttons with their thumb. What's the tool in this picture? What's the tool? It's the person's thumb, right? The target is the button that they're trying to push. The person's thumb is the tool. Okay, but you see a problem here? What is this? What problem that we've already talked about does this person have? Right, wash rag, right? So do we change the tool or do we change the target? Better change the target. Can't change the tool in this situation. And that's what this is. These are light touch palm buttons. Okay? There are beams of light that shoot right here, and there's a beam of light over here. When you stick your hand in it, the machine cycles or it does whatever you want it to do. And when you do that, look how nice and straight my wrist is. Even if you put your fingers in it, your wrists are straight. Not only that, you don't have to press down on it. That's a force. So there's force and posture. These are pretty cheap. Really, I really start to see a lot of companies use these. They're easy to install. So that's the answer. Elbows out. Elbows out, wash rag, and tool target often see in groups. Okay. If I were to give somebody this marker and I hand it to them in this orientation, up like this, and I told them to write their name on this piece of paper. First thing they do, bend their wrist like this. Next thing they do is this. And that's elbow sound. Why didn't I just go like this? Because it hurts. It's very uncomfortable to do that. Your brain knows this, and it knows, oh, all of a sudden all I have to do is put my elbow out and my wrist is straight. It no longer hurts. Okay, so that's what elbow sound is. Here's a, a, another steel company, a hot rolling operation. Is this elbows out? I see the elbow sticking out. Here's using another tool. This is a tool target issue, too. Okay. See what I mean? The elbows are just way winged out like that. Okay, that vibe is referred to vibration. Have you ever driven down the road and seen somebody use a jackhammer? You know this can't be good for you. Their whole body is shaking. Okay, their voice is even shaking. can't even talk. Okay, the reason why vibration is bad for you is because it constricts your blood vessels. It decreases the blood flow to the muscles that you're using. And decreasing the blood flow slows down the healing process. You don't want to do that. It invites right into the door cumulative trauma disorders. I've already talked about those. Um, I was just home for the weekend and my dad was working on the lawn. He's out there with a weed whacker comes in, his hand's all white. What the heck did you do? He said, I don't know, there's something wrong with the weed whackers. It wasn't like this before. And he'd come out and look at it. He's always asking my expert advice, right, about ergonomics. So he's holding it. I don't see a problem, Dad. Your wrists are nice and straight. Turn it on. He turns it on. <laughs> That's the problem. Okay? Constricting blood vessels. It just caused his whole hand to go white. His chainsaw does the same thing to him. Okay, but that's really not that big of a problem. It happens once a week. When you're in your job and it's happening every day, you have a frequency problem, then you're in trouble. This is one of the ones that's not a posture that vibes. This guy has a vibration problem. So you're probably wondering what the heck do you do about it? You can't really get rid of the tool. You need it. It's vibrating for a reason. There's a couple things you can do. You can either pad the handles of the tool with this special type of material it's made for. It's called sorbethane and it absorbs vibration. Okay, and you can tell a big difference. It's vibrating much less when you have this stuff on there. Or you can wear gloves made out of the same material. And that's what this guy did. This is a steel straightening task. He feeds it in the machine. And while he's doing it, it's shaking. You can't pad what's shaking in this case. It's going through the machine. But he is wearing the gloves. It makes a big difference. Grinding operators have this. You can't really tell that grinding tool is vibrating that much. It's not nearly as obvious as the jackhammer. It's still vibrating the hands and wrists, though. What they ended up doing was patting the handle until tool and giving them the gloves. Remember we talked about that median nerve that runs through your wrist? There's another one down there, too. It's called the ulnar nerve. And it kind of passes the side of that tongue. And it comes up through your elbow. This is what you hit when you hit your funny bone. That's 
why it hurts. There's a nerve right there. And both those nerves come up, join together with some other nerves to form a nerve bundle in your shoulder. And that nerve bundle is connected to the top of your neck, top of your spinal cord. Okay, so here's a close-up of your shoulder region. Collarbone, some other bones in there, muscles, tendons, nerve bundles. A lot going on in here. When you start working with your hands above your head like that, you're making that area in your shoulder even smaller. There's not a whole lot of room in there to begin with. And the same problem with carpal tunnel. Remember, there wasn't enough room in there. If you start to wear and tear those tendons, you're going to start to pinch on those nerves. Okay, so that's what we mean when we say shoulder too high, shoulder too low. Okay? If your shoulder's too high, your job is too high. If you're working down here, shoulder too low, same thing happens. Decreases that area. Okay, so is this too high or too low? Too high. What about this guy? Remember when you were a kid, your, your kids might still, you might do this still, make snow angels? Remember that? Lay down the snow, move your arms and legs like this. You get up and you look. Did you see a bunch of squares out there? I hope not. <laughs> Those aren't snow angels, huh? Okay, you saw a bunch of arcs, right? It's because we reach for these arcs. We move in arcs. Not only that, but we see in arcs. Okay, when I look out here, I see most comfortably 15 degrees to my right and left and 15 degrees up and down. So when those two areas come together where I can see the best or I can reach the best, it's something we call a comfort zone. Okay, it's where I'm most comfortable. It's where I'm the strongest, where I'm the most efficient. It's at waist level. It's not down here and it's not up here. It's that shoulder too high and shoulder too low. Waist level, it's not too close to me either because then I've got to tilt my neck down. It's about six inches in front of me, right here. Okay, so is this person in their comfort zone? Nope, way too low. How about this person? Now you reach it up. What else does this guy have? Look down the list here. See anything else? Yep, he's got a wash rag. He's got shoulder too high. And comfort zone. Okay, so they can pile up. You could have this whole list of your job. Hungry head. I don't know if you uh, watch TV at all. I tend to watch way too much TV. Have you seen the new Taco Bell commercials? You have the Taco Neck Syndrome. I love that commercial. He is tilting his neck so that he can eat his taco without his filling falling out. And he's eaten way too many tacos. And his neck gets stuck. And that probably wouldn't happen in real life. Neck gets stuck. He's got to go to the doctor. It's very similar to hungry head. It's any neck posture you're using usually to see something. Our head is hungry for information. Usually trying to see something, trying to hear something. It's any backwards, sideways, twisted, forwards, neck posture. Okay. There's three people in this slide. Believe it or not. Do they all have hungry head? Yeah. Can you see the third three people? Yeah. It took me forever to see that too. I don't know, it's just a bad picture. Okay, they all have hungry head. This guy person in this one too. He's looking kind of down and behind him. That's a great example of hungry head. Okay, the back. This is our last body structure. The back is the most studied body part out there. More so than the brain and more so than the heart. They don't even understand everything about the heart and brain. They're studying the back. There's a reason though. 80% of us, 80% of working Americans are going to get a back problem, back injury at some point. That's not very encouraging, is it? Not only that, they cost a fortune, and you're out forever, it seems like. Okay, so they cost a fortune, and in fact, the most uh, expensive injury you can get. Not illness, but an injury. Okay. So let's take a look at the, uh, the guy on the left there, the rear view of the back. It looks like a nice straight column, doesn't it? We know from architecture that columns are very strong, very stable, they hold up big buildings. That's not the case. When you turn to the side, it's an S-curve. Okay. S-curves make that whole thing very unstable. But it allows me to bend and lean and move, walk properly. It gives me mobility. I need that S-curve, but it just made my back unstable. Let's take a close-up picture of the spine here. These uh, bones that are sticking out right here are the ones you can feel for your skin. And these arrows are pointing to your discs. 
this is your spinal cord running through here. There's nerves coming out between each of the bones. Those discs kind of remind me of day-old jelly donuts. They're kind of rough and tough and hard on the outside, but they're filled with this jelly substance. It allows my spine to have kind of a uh, shock absorber in there. So when I walk or when I run or move that, my spine lengthens and shortens, and it takes some of that shock. And in a nice, healthy back, those discs allow enough room for these nerves to pass through here, pass through these holes. Okay, but in an unhealthy back like this one, see that disc? See how flat it is? Somebody just sat on that jelly donut. All the filling came out. Now flat. That looks like it hurts. I know back specialist, but I know that that hurts. I'm sure this has happened to somebody in this room. It's a slip disc. It's a ruptured disc. This is what caused the push. Okay, so this bone is now sitting on this nerve. And that, we've already discussed this. This is pinching of the nerve. Carpal tunnel syndrome happens in your shoulder, happens in your back. When this happens, a lot of times you feel a lot of sharp shooting pain going down your leg. Okay, people complain of this all the time. Usually the nerve that gets pinched like that is the one that's going to one of your legs. So that's why that happens. So when you start working, in postures like this guy on the left bending over like that, or this guy, that's what we call butts up. You should remember very obvious reasons why it's called that. Okay, we see this all the time. It's the most common one out there. People leaning over usually to get something off the ground, something that's too low. What other problems does this guy have? Shoulder too low. Can't definitely comfort zone. Probably hungry head, can't really tell, can't see his wrist too much either. So he's got a couple of these. Horizontal distance. I don't know if you've ever tried this. Try picking up 10 pounds, hold it close to your body. Feels like 10 pounds, right? Do this. Feel like 10 pounds now? Okay, don't do that. I'm just kidding. Don't do it. Feels like 150 pounds. As you move out 30 inches or so, it gets multiplied out there. Okay, that's what we mean by horizontal distance. You don't want to have that. You want to bring everything close to you. Even just reaching for something small, the weight of your hand, the weight of your arm, gets multiplied out 15 times when you've got that far. Okay, so this person has a horizontal distance problem, reaching for something. What else? Think he's in his comfort zone, having to lean like that? No. Okay, so he's got a couple problems. Same slide as the butts up. He's got horizontal distance. Not have everything else we just mentioned. Okay, twist and shout. If I were finished with this Coke can, which I'm not, how would I go about breaking it, uh, tearing it apart? Most likely do is bend it in half a couple times, which kind of reminds me of butts up, right? Bending back and forth, back and forth. That's we can do. That's a pretty stable structure to begin with. We don't even have that on our sides with our back. <coughs> A stable structure, I'm bending it back and forth. What do I have to do to break it apart? One little twist. Not even two. One. The whole thing falls apart. That's what twist and shout is. It's very easy to find, too. See the diagonal lines on that guy's shirt? They're always there with twist and shout. Can you see those lines? It's, it's a foolproof, foolproof way to see if you've got twist and shout. You always have them. What is happening here is um, he's trying to control something. His control panel is off to the side. What he's trying to control is right in front of him. His feet are pointing towards it. Control panel here. I notice I have to twist my back to get to it. Not only that, I'm looking back and forth. Is that common sense to put the control panel right there? No. It really needs to be here. This is what's happening uh, to people's neck when their monitor is over here and their keyboard is over here. Okay? You're twisting your neck with them. Same thing. Sit stand. Did you ever notice when you have a party or you have people over your house and everybody ends up in the kitchen? Why is that? You can put all the food and drink out there, but people will still be in the kitchen. Did you ever notice this? People like to do this on that countertop. You'll notice this now. This is my favorite part of the class because I kind of get to sit down. Okay, this is called sit standing. I'm not sitting and I'm not standing. Kind of halfway in between. And there's products out there that look like this. 
that are actually called sit stands. It's a product that is very easy to get in and out of, more so than a chair, when they don't have that knee support. I don't particularly like knee support. You can't get in and out of it quite so easy. But the reason it feels good on your back is because it gives you a different tilt. If you're to look at your spine when you're standing, it looks completely different than when you're sitting. And it looks different when you're leaning. Something very comfortable, especially those of us who have been sitting all day or standing all day. And there's another uh, concept very similar to this, is the foot rail. It's about six inches off the ground and you prop your foot up on it. It feels good to your back. Okay. There's institutions all over the country that have figured this foot rail idea out. Not only that, they pad the edges. What you're leaning against. They want your time and your money. But it's far. Far. <laughs> exactly. Bars have figured out the foot rail idea. Okay, they're smart. They know that feels good on your back. Okay, the last one on here is don't give me static. Static refers to static muscle loading. Okay, it means when you're standing there flexing your muscles for a long period of time. I watched one of my friends put in a ceiling fan in his new house. Have you ever done this? Don't do it. If you have a choice, don't do it. He's up there up the ceiling, putting the ceiling fan in for about 15 minutes. He doesn't have the right tools, and he's, uh, he's not a happy guy if there's some swearing going on. He can't uh, get the wires in there quite right. He's just pretty much unhappy. There. 15 minutes later, he comes down, his neck hurts, shoulders hurt, back hurts, legs hurt. He's crabby, he's yelling at his wife, <laughs> and he's tired. He's thinking to himself, why am I so tired? I didn't just run a marathon. I've only been out there for 15 minutes. Because you're standing there flexing your muscles for that long, you never let them relax. Okay, when we walk, different muscles in our legs flex and then they relax. They flex and then they relax. That's moving, that's dynamic. You're standing there flexing, holding it, like this guy. Standing there holding that beam, okay? That's not good for you. Remember I said machines are better at certain things? That's one of them. Okay, this table here, it's pretty good at holding my slide projector. One of you guys could have held my slide projector for me, couldn't you? Yeah, probably got heavy by the end of the day, right? Fixtures or machines are much better at it. Okay, here's a good example. She is holding the part she's working on. It's the same part, day after day, hour after hour. Maybe she changes parts, but it's the same type of part. She's working on it with her other hand. She's done, she gets the next one. Okay, she's statically holding that part. Her hand isn't moving. By the end of the day, she's doing this. Hands cramped up. She's statically holding that part. What they actually ended up doing was getting her a fixture. She puts this part in this fixture. She never has to hold the part again. She's working with both hands. She's much more comfortable. Okay, not only that, she produced twice as many of them. Okay, ergonomics is about quality, about comfort, and about productivity and efficiency. There's all these things mixed in there. Okay, the last phrase on here, ask the operator. That's you. Should read, ask the expert. So you know 10 times more about your job than I ever will. Okay, try your job. She know what you like about your job. She do every day. Do what you hate about your job, too. And now you know what's wrong with your job. And that's why everybody's going through this. You now know what all these things mean. And that handout helped me remind you what they mean. We didn't really get a chance today to go into how to fix too many of these things. We did a little bit. The handout's pretty good for that. It takes a little longer to get it into uh, how to fix everything. But some of the supervisors, the safety guys, have been through how to fix it. They've gone through two days with instead of an hour. Okay, so that's what they want you to do. They want you to take this back to your job and see what you have. As office employees, I can guarantee you have a wash, right? And okay, bending of the wrist, the most common problem. Okay, problems with your back, another one. Okay, is there any questions? I show this slide if you haven't fallen asleep. <laughs> you don't get that free to be home asleep. Okay? So don't don't do this, okay? This is uh, this is laziness. Take this card back and see what you can find. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a couple things. Wash ray. That's good. Okay, no questions or anything? Comments? Did you learn? Do you know what ergonomics is now? Okay, that's what the point was. Okay, thanks for your time and your attention. I think the point of what they're trying to do out in the shops too is if you have something in your everyday activity that you, you see violates this, so let's you know try to figure out ways to get around it so you, you get yourself out of that situation. So, and that's that's the whole purpose. Right.